Hi, this is Seamless, and this is the making of Force Multiplier. Force Multiplier, in case you haven't heard, is a track I did recently. There's a link to it in the description for the original video. As with most of my tracks, um, the FLP is available for purchase through Black Octopus Sound. The price is, at minimum, one cent. You can pay whatever you want for it above that amount. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to show portions of the drop and then also some of uh, the main chorus. And then I'll get to start describing how things are and what things are, are, 2D2. So yeah, uh, I'm just gonna start applying from some random point. <laughs> should do fine. So, um, in my opinion, the most interesting part of this track are the sounds that you hear coming from the red prismatic pattern labels. And for me, they're most interesting because they are just a harmer by themselves with no automation going on whatsoever. Uh, the only effects that are controlling the sound that we're hearing is the uh, Hertz unison setting and also a custom prism mapping. I am underrunning like crazy. Yeah, I, I have it set to a lower latency setting because I've been practicing on the uh, launch pad earlier. But um, what am I saying? So I covered in how to base 12 how to make a custom prism mapping. Um, so you can go look at that. I'll have a link in the description for that as well. Um, but this is the custom, custom prism mapping that I'm using. And I have it set to the uh, multiply mode because what that does is it applies it harder than it would if it were just the uh, add mode. And uh, But as you see, I have a very slightly engaged. But still pretty effective. So what's up with the Hertz unison setting? Well, I don't really know the fundamentals of why the Hertz unison is different from the rest of the unisons, but it is. Boy, is it ever. And if you have a very slight uh, phase setting with a mo pretty moderate pitch setting and nine voices engaged, it'll create that kind of vowel -y sound. Um, again, not 100% sure why. It has something to do with the fact that the way that the, it's, the, the pitch is phased and the, the harmonics are in, into playing with each other, that creates a kind of... Um, it creates the effect. I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. I have no idea. It just doesn't. All right? That's all there is to it. The, only, the unfortunate thing about this kind of setup, though, is that you don't really have a huge amount of control over uh, the sound itself. How fast it is and where it goes is determined by the pitch and face settings, which you can control. You can map them to X and Y and that kind of thing, and Z, because there's a Z in Harmer. And um, you can sort of do that, but it won't, it won't be as direct a control as if you had just made an FM patch and something else. But it's pretty interesting that you can do something like that in Harmer. So that's what's going on in stuff like this section. And all the little red moments you see in these drops. Good times. So the next most interesting thing would be these audio files, which are... Harmer resampled audio. 
these are actually the um, the original sounds and also the the resample steps that I demonstrated in um, uh, the SoundCloud link I posted a long time ago that showed a up and coming upcoming uh, Harmer resampling preset pack that I'm working on. Um, this is actually from that set. It's called Square Dist and Square A1 and A2. There is an A3, but for this track, I decided not to use A3, just because I liked how A2 sounded for this uh, moment. However, in the SoundCloud link, that used A's 1 through and 3. A's 1 through 3. 1, 2, and 3. Words. I speak them, and you hear them. So that's basically what that is. If you have no idea what harmony resampling is, I suggest uh, checking out How to Base 7 and 9. Those are the latest ones that I, I use the um, that particular uh, technique for. But a quick primer, the, what's going on is that this sound, I made a pattern and recorded it out into Edison, and then I clicked this button here, which is the drag, click a drag icon, I'll drag whatever fo files in there. I dropped it into square A1, then I recorded that out, dropped it into square A2, and that resulted in these audio files. <laughs> You'll notice when you download a file that a lot of these are chopped up and blended with other files and a couple of them aren't even like starting where they start or ending when they end. And that's just, be that's just because for me anyway, that's how the harmony reset this tends to work is that the original file that you end up doing wasn't really, didn't really work when you hit the end result. But if you start it differently and just play around and try to get more creative with cutting it, you can get something that you weren't really planning on getting but is kind of cool anyway. And and that's just that's just based on how I use it. Other people have been a little bit more successful in getting the kind of control they want out of the harmony sampling thing, but that's just for me. And the uh and just purple stuff. These are actually um there's two of them. They're they're uh, different settings of the square disc channel. I didn't resample these, I just used them as they are. I altered them, altered them slightly to um, accommodate what I wanted to do with them there. And then, of course, there's the big green guy. These are just your average citrus channels that are your basic FM bass. There's a, they're a tiny bit more complicated in, in that um, I'm running two primary outputs and a reinforcing sub, and also some effects. And uh, you see how there's the automation going on on the X envelope, which is controlling the um, overall FM amount. It's also controlling the reverb volume in the FX channel, FX insert. And that's giving it that um, increased spatial sound. So the um, setup in here is... Two is the primary, um, ba the bass pitch modulator, and three is the high harmonic. It's going into one and five. Five is set to be a little bit higher in pitch, and that gives it that, that kind of pitch warble as you go higher in, in uh, pitch. Adds additional modulation and stuff like that. Uh, X controls the overall modulation and the primary outputs and why it controls the third OP third operators um, FM amount because the third operator is being FM to buy op four and it creates this effect <laughs> where no FM is where three is not FM at all and all Y is where it's being FM to buy four completely <laughs> It's a really basic FM setup. I've covered this many times in most of my uh, tutorial videos. Um, it's really not very unique or inventive as far as things that I've done in tracks go, but I was focusing more on the Harmer stuff on this one and keeping it less confusing. But believe me, the next track is going to be crazy. It's going to be Vocadex everywhere. And this is going to be nuts. Um, lots of people have been talking, to, asking, asking me about how I do my mixing and mastering for these things. And 
I'm just gonna say I compress the shit out of everything. I'm gonna show you. So uh, let's take the drums for example. Add a filter on it. Let's turn the filter off. So I'm just gonna turn all the effects off and we'll hear it like without it. The snare is actually hilariously quiet, as you can tell. There's uh, some EQ going on and the snare and the, the kick, but really where all the magic happens is in the Maximus channels. Now what's cool about Maximus is the how how you can handle compressing something. So like in here, uh, you see you see in um, you, you can kind of accomplish this by using a limiter. I actually used to use a limiter for things like bass antics and whatnot because I didn't own Maximus at the time, but now I do, and now I use Maximus because it's better. But um, you see this uh, the the one that you're greeted with when you look at it just normally is this. You get uh you get th this this middle line represents zero dB, and this is an in out graph. So that means that if it's this volume, then in it's all gonna it's gonna be that volume out. And if it's this, when I get up here, you can, if you, you'll see that if it's this volume in, it's gonna remain this volume out because it's compressing it down to zero dB. But you can do things like change the tension of this of this line here. So that means that if it's this volume in, it's gonna be this volume out. It's gonna be a lot louder, and that's basically the basics of compression right there and what makes maximus very good is that it's a multi-band compressor so you can weight different um areas of the spectrum and it won't affect the other areas of the spectrum and so you do it on the master channel now on the master channel what i like to do with the drums and also the master for edm stuff i don't do this for the metal stuff or the big epic orchestra things i do much more meticulous and subtle things but for EDM, just crush everything and soft saturation as far as the eye can see. Now, what does soft saturation do? Well, you see here how I have this line not at 0 dB. It's not doing anything, which means that, well, it's doing some things, but basically it means that if it's going above 0 dB, it's going to go above 0 dB. But here is where the magic happens. See, in this threshold, if you turn it on just slightly, just super slightly, in either, either direction, there's two directions you can go in, but they if you keep it as the, the most slight setting they both do the same thing where it will cut it will completely cut anything that goes above zero db and that's distortion and that's what distortion is that's how distortion works except for more complicated algorithms but the most basic kind of distortion is where it's cut so hard that it creates square waves so then everything is compressed it's going huge and it makes it very loud and we don't want it to go above zero db so we'll just and that's creating that kind of distorted sound that you're hearing in the snare. And you, know, you remember how quiet the snare was before, right? And that's because the snare is on top of the kick. And so it's being uh, reinforced. Also in the snare, channel by its... I am eating my voice because I'm smart. But in the snare channel by itself... You hear that kind of sort of distorted sound going on in the fundamental here. I'm peaking it up, and then I'm using the limiter to, again, engage soft saturation to distort it. And that's cause, that's creating that kind of tony, tony note sound in the fundamental frequency of the snare. And I like that, I like that sound. And it makes that for, you know, nice crunchy sort of sound. And now you, you heard the crash going on, and you also heard how it kind of cut out whenever there's a kick going on. It's because I'm, I'm using side chain compression for every single thing in this track. You see here I have an effects insert labeled side. And everything is being routed into that. And if something is not being routed into that, it's because it's being routed to something else that's being routed into that. Or it's being compressed individually by the kick for a reason. Like if I wanted to have like the riser or the arp going on here. I wanted to have that. I wanted to have that be compressed by the side chain, but I didn't want it to, have to be that as hard as as everything else. Then I did it individually with the kick. Same thing with the uh, hats and the kick, and the kick and the drum mixing. 
the hats are going in the drum mix, but they're not, they're not being compressed by the side, but I wanted to have that anyway, so I put it, an extra one in the uh, hats. So how does side chain compression work? Well, let's open up the track. Now in FL, there's a number, number, oh my leg. There's, a, there's numbers of ways to do this, but the one that I use is that I load up a limiter and then you can uh, go, if you go into the compression tab down here, you can see this one by default, then you go to comp. You have a side chain option. If you right click it, it'll, it'll list all of the inputs that are being routed into the bus. So I have kick selected, but you notice how when I have kick routed into this channel, the, the volume's off in the send here. And that's because the kick, I don't want the kick audio to go in there. I just want the kick audio information, the peak information, the transients to go into the side chain, the side chain channel. And that information is what's compressing everything else. <laughs> So this does two things. It creates that kind of cool pumping effect that, effect that people like to hear in these kinds of tracks. And it also lets you push the track a lot harder in the master because the kick is creating a nice hole in everything else sonically. And that means that you don't have to do things like scoop out the the frequencies of the bass because the kick is gonna be too much. It's gonna it's gonna make everything muddy. Cause it'll just do that automatically. And so that, that makes the master mastering mixing job a lot easier. So in the master, you see I have a, an EQ going. You see also that I'm, I'm having, I have the uh, volume way down and that's actually not gonna matter for you guys watching the video. It's because I don't want, I have my monitors on and I'm not using headphones when I'm recording this. I don't want feedback, so I'm turning it down. And uh, however, for you, it's gonna be full volume because I'm recording it straight into this Edison, which is not being attenuated at all in volume. So you guys are gonna hear everything at max volume, which you have been for this whole time. So. That being the case, here's the here's the master maximus. And I'm employing basically the same thing as in the drum mix, which is the tiniest bit more uh, subtle. But then, I, of course, I also have the soft saturation going on in the in the master right there. Now, lots of people are going to point out. I I can see this already. Lots of people in the comments are going to point out that this is not necessarily the greatest method of mastering. It's not the most transparent. It's not even the, the, the best way to make something as loud as possible, if that's what you want to do, or even that the loudness war is bad and you shouldn't do it. Well, you know, they're right to a certain extent, but that's just what I do. Seriously, it's like, it's just how I manage to do things. It's not the end all. I'm not saying it's the best. It's just how things have happened. And if you like it, you can use it. If you don't like it, you can find some other way to use it. You use something else that doesn't necessarily crush everything as hard as possible. I just happen to like things to be crushed as hard as possible because everything is not heavy enough. So if I play a track, you can see how everything works again. So why is that better? Why is using soft saturation better than traditional compression? Well, uh, traditionally, this is what the default um, compression would sound like without it. And I could do things like uh, turn all this down and it would probably give me the, the same result. Oops. So sometimes you tend to get it gets a little artifacty, you know. You, that's what they mean when they when you hear compression artifacts and stuff like that. It's when it's you get kind of warbly sounds or like just just weird things that you associate with a less than good compression job, and uh, that's why I like the soft saturation is my primary method of master compression because it doesn't it doesn't have the traditional uh, art compression artifacts associated with it. It has much more mean things going on because it's basically just distortion um i do have normal compression going on in all the other bands though and some of them do end up getting loud enough or maybe not but um that's been yeah. but for things like the high band like if i if we were to listen to that by itself where's the solo button It 
if there's compression artifacts going on in there, that's not really going to be noticeable in the end mix. But again, people are going to point out that it's not the greatest thing ever to do. Um, I was mentioning this EQ earlier. I have this EQ, and I'm cutting everything below 30-ish hertz, 32 hertz or whatever. But like, that's not really audible on the majority of people's sound systems. Sure, people could have awesome subwoofers and whatnot, but that's still, that's still information in the audio that's only really just going to screw with your compression and mastering. Like the whole reason why we have multiband compressors is that we can compress this and like like again here like I mentioned the high like there's, there's compression going on in the uh, at at zero dB at the, the high band, but because it's only going on in the high band, the fact that it's compressing up there isn't compressing the low and the mids, which is what would happen if you were using say, just a limiter on everything. But um, that's what the basics of how the mix works in this track. And again, people are going to show it's not the most professional thing in the world. It's not the greatest like smartest engineering in the universe that's fine they could have that opinion or fact it just it doesn't doesn't matter at all like this is really just answering people who were asking me how to do this and whatnot like I, I actually have been avoiding talking about mixing and mastering just because i feel like there's already a thousand videos on youtube about how to do stuff like that and well whatever it's there now i hope, hope that doesn't damage your future because you do bad things as described by people who would say they know better. Um, the rest of these synths that are going on... I actually think I used a uh, Arc Sun preset in here. This is a Toby preset. Uh, is it this one? Yeah. Arc Sun, if you didn't know, released a pack of 64 free Harbor presets. And I decided to take some look. That's yeah, I need more than one. For basically everything that's not bass, I tend to use presets just because I'm awful at everything that's not bass. There's not much else to that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, if you want to have a more hands-on look at this file, um, you can buy the FLP from Black Octopus. There's going to be a link in the description for that. And... Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me about it. If you have any problems with uh, downloading the file or any kind of interaction with Black Octopus, please ha please contact Black Octopus Support. I have no control over that. And Toby is usually pretty good about handling that. People have been satisfied in the past. So yeah, this has been making of Force Multiplier. Thanks for watching. I hope you've learned something. I really do. Yay.